So today we'll be presenting on some of the work we did in the Osnum initiative, uh, particularly looking at um, land and water and the data that we have um, in, in CSIRO and how to make that interoperable um, accordingly to some of the principles that FAIR espouses. Uh, but as, as we will talk about um, some of the implementations that we have explored around the FAIR principles into actionable uh, questions to address um, you know, how fair your data is. So um, if you haven't come across Osnome, um, this is a CIRO-led initiative uh, aiming to connect information ecosystems around Australia. The Osnome name uh, was coined echoing the genome project, so um, Oz being Australia and the Gnome being a genome kind of inspired uh, project. But really what we're looking at here is tools, uh, services, products, um, uh, methods, approaches and practices and infrastructure to support um, having more connected information infrastructures. Um, and in the, in the previous year, we, as Keith mentioned, we focused on environmental information infrastructures. Um, so a couple of links there you can follow. Um, and today we'll be talking about an example in the water space. Okay, so um, as part of establishing the Osnome uh, architecture, Osnome infrastructure, um, we felt that we needed to um, assist our potential data providers to understand what good data was, what in the context of this seminar series, what fair data is. Um, we all call it Osnome data. Um, and basically, we developed a um, rating, a set of rating criteria and a tool um, to allow um, assessment of, by data providers of the data of the data that they're they're providing. And this is just uh, on the right hand side of the screen here. Um, you can see a, a screen capture of the uh, the sort of the kickoff page of the of the tool. You'll also notice. Um, that we've got a, a, a slightly adapted version of the FAIR criteria, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, but we also add in um, uh, the last line there, trusted, um, which appears to go a little bit beyond what has been conceived in FAIR um, until now, but um, we suggest would be um, a useful addition. We're kind of bundling the interoperable and reusable together. We see those as being um, uh, very closely related, and, um, uh, and you know, obviously this is this, it's it's teasing out some of the um, issues around what it is that makes data interoperable. Keith's given a sort of a, a high level overview of, and and indicated what some of the concerns might be. We've uh, take done our own take on this a, a bit, um, actually fairly strongly leaning on our experience over a number of years, um, more than a decade now, actually of working in the with in the data standards communities, in particular the geospatial data standards communities and some of the learnings that we've got from there which we're applying directly um, in here, obviously environmental data which is what we're largely work, what we've, what our heritage is, where we've largely been working, a lot of that is geospatial so it, it makes sense to be, to be building on that. Now just a bit of a reminder, the Force 11 um, FAIR principles, this is a summary slide from um, Michel Dumontier who's one of the um, original authors of the papers and the developers of the FAIR principles. Um, they got these, um, the guiding principles with uh, the, 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 the four key words and, and teased out into three or four um, sort of sub-principles in each case with uh, the FAI and R letters. We're looking at the interoperable um, set here which um, Keith has already um, uh, shown. It's interesting that Michelle has recently done a study um, evaluating a number of repositories, particularly in Europe, but some of them are, are, are broader than that. But here's the list of repos repositories that were evaluated and scored those on the FAIR principles. The data is available um, in this form. Actually, this table shoots off to the right of the screen. There's lots more going on there. Um, but looking at the summary of the results, it's fairly notable that the tallest red bar here is in the interoperable category. So what this is saying is of the fair data principles, this is the one which is hardest to meet, the, hard, the one that's hardest to conform to. 
Um, and so really that's the focus um, of, of the approach that we've taken, which is to, to kind of lead people through how they can make their data more fair, more osnomic, more interoperable. Um, and the particular way in which we've broken out the question of interoperability is on, if you look at the, the, the numbered terms here, is it loadable, is it usable, is it comprehensible, is it linked, as well as is it licensed. And I'm just going to go through some of the details of those, and you'll see this, you know, in a sense is fairly repetitive of some of the concerns that Keith um, explained at the beginning, but we're, we're putting some, some more concrete examples onto um, these, uh, these criteria to, to, to indicate to our data providers that when we say a standard data format, we mean something like CSV or JSON or XML or NetCDF. These are all important file formats towards the left hand end there. You know, they're kind of general, but NetCDF is one that's used a lot in the remote sensing and environmental science communities. So we've got a bit of a, a ladder here of different levels of, con of conformance which you can reach about whether a data set would be loadable. Is it in a unique file format? Well, that means that you've got to have some unique software to load it. Or is it in a standard data format, um, denote, and um, normally that would be denoted by one of the standard MIME types. Best of all would be for data to provide, be provided in multiple standard formats, giving a choice to the user so that which, whatever their favorite platform for loading data they can, they can use. Next question, even when you've loaded it, can you use it um, if it's, uh, if, if, if the structures within the data set, even if it's loaded, if the structures are unclear, then it's not going to be very usable. And that is, comes down to the matter of, is there a schema that's provided um, which explicit, makes explicit the data, the structures within the data sets? Um, a lot of sort of traditional data, yeah, there's a structure in there, but the schema is not available independently of the data. If you like, the schema is implicit. It's not formalized. The schema maybe is different every time. A lot of spreadsheets are done that way. Spreadsheets got a lot of boxes, but if every time you use it, you add different columns and, uh, and use the, uh, the, the pages in a spreadsheet in a different way, then it's, it takes a little while for the user to get their heads around what's going on before they can use it. So there's various explicit schema languages like DDL, which is used for relational systems, XML schema, um, something coming out of the open knowledge world these days called data packaging, which allows you essentially to describe a schema for a CSV file. Then you've got in the, um, the RDF, the semantic web space, RDFS and OWL. JSON even has a schema language these days, although it's not broadly um, used. And so it's nice to provide data with a schema. But best of all would be to say, the data I'm using, I'm using this community schema, this community, and for example, the Open Geospatial Consortium provides a number of community schemas for observations, for time series, for hydrology, for geoscience, and if you're um, publishing or attempting to share data in any of these disciplines, then best to go off and find a community schema. Then, even when you've got it loaded and you understand what the structures are, you've still got the question about what the words and numbers are inside the boxes. Um, do the, uh, the column headings, um, are they explicit enough to understand? Are they just uh, um, shorthand for something which, which the project leader, when he was developing the data, knew that he, would un he or she would understand it the next week, but even he or she, if they came back to it the next year, may not understand it. Best, of course, is if the field labels are linked and do have tech explanations, probably in plain text. Better, better still is to use standard labels, for example, the unit, universal code for units of measure, units codes, or the climate and forecast conventions coming out of the fluid earth community. Um, so the ladder that we've got here says, are you using standard labels? Is it just some of the field names are linked to standard externally managed recoveries? Are all the field names linked to standard externally managed recoveries? And you get this ladder better and better and better. Um, and then the question about how well linked is your data? Well, um, if it's just a file sitting on a, on a server somewhere, there's no links in or out, yeah, 
you're, you're lucky to find it. Um, if um, most of the data sets that we're that in this community would be expecting is that they're they're indexed in a catalog or they're available from a landing page, and that's a situation where you've got inbound links to the data set. And best of all is when there are outbound links embedded or implicit in the data structures in the in, in a data set, which says exactly how it's related. And this links in with some of the, the previous concerns that we had there about field names and these kinds of things. So I'm going to hand back to Jonathan to tease through um, uh, a case study that we've got here, really based on the Aura L, um, Australian Water Resources Assessment data sets. Um, um, so, Jonathan. Yeah, so as mentioned earlier in the Osnan project, we looked at a practical example and case study um, in the Aura L data set. Um, this is a uh, continental cell data set that has historical um, time series from 1911. Uh, the Bureau published an operational version um, online. Uh, you can find that on their website. Uh, but often scientists have to uh, basically deal with this data set by knowing where it is and knowing how to use it implicitly um, and knowing how to reference the requisite geospatial features and um, understand the field name values. Um, so I've got an example in the uh, sorry. So the next next slide shows the um, assessment of, of it using our tool um, and just focusing on the interoperable side of things. Um, we have rated it as a web service, so it's you know we can get it via the web. Um, however, the reference definitions are text only, and they are they are localized um, in the data set itself. And I'll give an example in the next in the next slide. So this is coming out from the NetCDF metadata that this data set um, you can access this via you know online through threads or via the NetCDF tools. But this is a summary of the metadata that's in that, that comes along with the data. So we've got long name here, um, potential evapotranspiration. Um, we've got the name, which is a, a label for the, the field, E0 underscore AVG. Um, units, MM, and a standard name, which is a convention in NetCDF to, to refer to the actual observed property, which is E0 underscore AVG, which in this case is a part of the CF conventions that's often used with this format. So um, if you are an expert in this area and you've used this data set many times, you'll know what this is. If you are a newcomer, you have to do a lot of work to, well, a little bit of work to understand what actually this, this, this data field means. Um, and in the Osnan project, what we did was um, enrich this with external variables. So if you go to the next slide, Simon. Um, so this is the same field, um, it's, and we've added, uh, you can, you know, this added lines at the bottom here. They tease out what this particular data field means in the context of externally defined vocabularies. So we've now enriched this with a scale quantity kind identifier, potential evapotranspiration, and it's a HTTP URI where you can resolve it and get a definition. So similarly for substance attacks, unit ID and feature of interest. Um, and just talk about what they are. So this is what um, a part of the project was to explore. Um, could we define vocabularies for these from which we could reference out, outbound links from the data to the definition? Um, and this is just a summary of, of what we did in the context of the ORL data set. And this is an example of potential evapotranspiration. You know, we've got a conceptual model here where we've got broader notions of potential evapotranspiration, evapotranspiration, um, and we've got linked um, relationships out to things like field of uh, feature of interest, object of interest, and unit of measure. So this view provides a vocabulary entry for potential evapotranspiration. Not only the identifier for it, not only the description for it, but a, a rich, richer model than you would get from if you just had something in, in line. Um, so you've got outbound relationships from this concept to its related concepts, essentially. Um, so this is a demonstration of defining the concepts externally, um, having them quite richly ex um, explained through this medium, but having the ability to link that from the data set itself to this definition to make it more interoperable. So that if we have another data set that talked about potential evapotranspiration, 
it could potentially be linked and interoperable. A revised um, OSNO uh, maturity at estimation uh, using the OSNO five-star tool and just focusing on the interoperable uh, field, uh, we see that it's uh, for, for using the same tool and assessing it based on the criteria, we've gone up from two star to more than four, four stars uh, in, in the interoperable space. And the reason for that is that we now have reference definitions as linked data and externally hosted um, observed property vocabulary definitions rather than just um, you know, inline labels of what, what it is. Uh, it provides more interoperability and if the vocabulary was standardized, um, then we would have a high estimation in that field. But it's just a demonstration of how we went about um, making something more interoperable through the Osnum project. And yeah, I'll just pick up at the end here and um, just comment that when we were starting this data ratings exercise, we, we, we actually uh, didn't look at FAIR at the beginning. We developed our own set of um, criteria, these keywords here, and then subsequently correlated them with the, the, the FAIR principles. Um, one of the interesting things was there was um, three lines in this table here, the ones in red, which didn't correlate with concerns that had been identified within, within FAIR. And the first one might be seen as trivial, but we thought it was a question that was worth asking, particularly when working with um, research scientists and talking about making their data available, which was the question about, uh, the, the first question, is your data intended to be used by anybody else? There's lots of data generated, which is, which is never shared. Now, it's not necessarily a good thing, and to a certain extent, having the question there, um, you know, highlights the fact that there is a question to be asked and that some um, scientists need, uh, researchers need to be encouraged to think about making their data available, make, uh, about publishing it. So I think in terms of the FAIR principles, this one was the kind of the implicit starting point. Um, if it's published, it's in, it's, yes, it's implicitly FAIR. A couple of other rows. One concern which comes up particularly, we've worked a lot with um, agencies that have sort of systematic data collection processes with systematic curation and maintenance, revisiting a data set is refreshed every day or every month or every year or that. Um, that concern didn't seem to be particularly um, addressed in the FAIR principles as they stand. And so we'd say, you know, the concern about whether the data is expected to be updated and maintained are maybe a bit more than FAIR. And the bottom row there as well was the concern about, um, you know, this, this is a, if you like, an, an, an elaboration of um, the assessment of data that you might do, um, which is to, um, assess, uh, to, to get some information about how well trusted it is. Now, a lot of that's about who else is using it, um, how much it's, well, that, that's often the criteria you'll use, who else is using it, um, how many times has it been used, what other products has, has, has it been, uh, um, have been generated from this, um, uh, from this data set, and so can I trust it? So uh, just emphasizing that row there um, is the um, interoperable, um, corresponds with the interoperability, which is what we've really been focusing on today. Um, the use of standards, I guess. Uh, standards is a, a funny word. You have to be a bit careful with it. Capital S standards, sometimes people think that's just to do with ISO or Australian standards or whatever. Really, the point about standards is that they are community agreements. They are community agreements which are um, available for additional members of the community to join in. Um, but, but, think of, uh, but, but it's important to think of them as, as agreements, agreements to do things in a common way. So finally, just a slide with some, um, some links to some of the material that we've been um, showing today. And we'll say uh, thank you for listening.